Hello and welcome to the Permaculture Podcast with Scott Mann, a listener-supported program. My guest for this episode is Jude Hobbs. Jude runs Cascadia Permaculture located in Cottage Grove, Oregon, and is a longtime permaculture designer and teacher. 2015 is her 15th year offering a permaculture teacher training, and that class forms the basis of our conversation. She shares with us what the course is like, the materials covered, the importance of set and setting, and walks us through what one can expect during the class. As a graduate of this program in 2011, I also share some of my memories and how that event and Jude's tutelage influenced my path. Using that as a point of reflection, she shares how the class has changed in the four years since then, as this is an ever-evolving program that expands based on her experiences and emerging literature on experiential education. Jude is also a founding member of PINA, Permaculture Institute of North America. We spend some time at the end of this interview discussing what PINA is, the ways we as permaculture practitioners can benefit from this grassroots-oriented professional organization, and how you can connect to learn more or become a member. If you would like to take a teacher training with Jude, there is an upcoming class being offered in cooperation with Beyond Organic Design at The Commons in Brooklyn, New York at the end of June 2015. I will also be there for part of the day on Sunday, June 28th, as I'm scheduled to be a guest instructor in the evening. Find out more details about that opportunity at beyondorganicdesign.org. Now then, on to the interview. I'll join you again afterwards with details about this upcoming class and some information on how the teacher training influenced my direction. Then Jude, could you give us a bit of your biography and background, how you came to permaculture and your current work? And then we can talk about what a permaculture teacher training is. Great. Thank you, Scott. It's great to be talking with you today. I would say that, you know, my love of nature began when I started to climb the sycamore tree in our suburban backyard in southern New Jersey and uh, investigating the bugs and, uh, you know, what was going on within the bark and the leaves. And it just really changed my world considerably. And my family were minimalist gardeners, and I learned a little bit about vegetable gardening at that time and the soil and got to understand that. And that was pretty much my youth and what I experienced in that world. And then to fast forward in my young adulthood, I studied psychology in college with a focus on horticulture therapy. And then in the mid-70s, I moved west and landed a job at Jackson County Mental Health, which is in southern Oregon. I worked there for several years and then realized for my personal mental health that I really wanted to get out of the clinic environment and focus more on plants. So I purchased my roommate's landscape maintenance business and pretty much the rest is history. I realized that I really needed some more education. The -the on-the-ground training was not quite enough, and so I started working in garden centers and then went back to school for ornamental horticulture with a focus on design. And then by then I was in Portland, Oregon and started my first business, Cascadia Landscape Design, um, which was pretty much a conventional design and installation business. And then 1984, I attended a course, uh, Edible Landscape Design with world-renowned authors, Roz Greasy, Robert Keurig, Kate Gessert. And this totally changed my perspective how to include food in a beautiful way within the landscape. So I did that for a while, and then the following year, in 1985, I was invited with about 12 other folks to Wigby Island, which is in Washington, for a crash course in permaculture, and that was taught by Sago Jackson and several others who were, um, had been taught by Bill Mollison. And by the end of that six-day experience, my world was totally rocked into a place of no return. And so for the next five years, I included many of the permaculture's design systems in my landscape work. And then 1990, I helped organize an advanced course in design teaching with Australians Max Lindiger and Lee Harrison. And that same year, Michael Polarski asked me to co-teach a permaculture design course, which I agreed to do with the caveat that I would get a permaculture certificate. So since then, I've been teaching PDCs, and then 2001, I taught my first teacher training, which is based on the course that I took with Max and Lee. And so as a self-employed person, I have four ways I make a living. Um, As an educator through my business, Cascadia Permaculture, a landscape designer, agroecology Northwest is another business that I have where I work with farmers 
and um, also I work with two nonprofit organizations where we specialize in guiding farmers towards best management practices. And then my fourth income stream is Wilson Creek Gardens, which is a permaculture demonstration site where I currently live, which is seven and a half acres, and bringing in a wide variety of the permaculture systems. As with many of us who practice permaculture, a varied background to bring you from where you were to where you are today. <laughs> exactly. But, uh, you know, people often ask me, you know, how do I get, how did, because I've been doing this for over 30 years, it's like, what is the what is the pathway? How do I, you know, in working with younger people, it's like, what is the path? And, and many of us aren't comfortable going through a traditional learning environment or going to college. And uh, after maybe we've all, like I did, I just, you know, did the traditional path and then realized that's not really where I wanted to go. And so the on-the-ground training for me was, was really some of the most important parts of my learning. Combining that classroom experience along with that you had learned over the years with the experiential and experimental learning of working on the ground? Exactly. Then how does that perspective influence the teacher training that you provide? And I guess before we get too far into that, what is a permaculture teacher training? For me, the teacher training offers a general toolkit as a guide to sharing information in an effective way. That's what education is, is sharing information. And so... I'd like to really start from a place where, from the permaculture perspective. So the focus of permaculture is land-based whole systems design application, right? So a teacher training or teaching is more focused on a person-based whole systems design practice or approach. You know, there's the sense of place that's also important, important wherever one is teaching. But it's, you know, there's the land-based and then there's the people-based. And I come from a place of thinking about, you know, how can we change the conventional education system, you know, where children are taught by sitting in straight rows or on comfortable seats, you know, with few breaks and little creativity, and then going to, you know, higher education where it's a similar environment, where there isn't that opportunity where the environment of critical thinking is not really enhanced. You know, people are usually, or students are usually talked at versus engaged in dynamic interchanges. And so for me, in guiding this practice of sharing information, um, my goal is to change the educational paradigm. And I'm doing it, I feel like, one person at a time and offering examples or this toolkit as in this teacher training of how to do that. So. As an example, the average adult's attention span is about between 8 seconds and 20 minutes. And so you know, what are ways that one can offer up to keep one's attention to the topic at hand? So for me, it's offering you know, dis discussions, having design games, people making posters to engage that side of their brain, storytelling, you know, outdoor activities the idea of experiential learning as opportunities to tap into a wide variety of learning styles. And that's really the mainstay of this, the teacher training that I offer, is just short of, sort of shaking it all up and having it so that we're moving from one interactive activity to another. And another way of doing that, of course, is you know, having co-instructors and bringing in guests and, and having participants see other people's styles of teaching and as well as focusing on each participant's personal skills, you know, doing asset mapping. What are the resources of you as a potential educator? And what is your forte? Just like if you're doing a, a permaculture design, uh, do you excel in doing, working with the plants? Or are you more focused on water? And, you know, the idea of bringing in what you are most comfortable doing and then um, and teaching that and then bringing in other people to work with you so that, so that students have or participants have different examples. And I will admit I am one of your former students. I was a graduate of the teacher training that you held at your home there at the gardens in 2011. And I got to experience a lot of that along with not only you teaching, but also Andrew Millison and then Rico Zook was a part of that. And I remember from the moment we got there, it was kind of on the ground running. 
And I think during that week-long experience, we had something like six or seven total presentation moments as participants the first day within, I think, about a half an hour of getting there and setting up my tent. I was then in the classroom giving a five-minute presentation on one of the principles of permaculture as overseen by RICO. We call that off the cuff. So it's like, you know, you, you walk down the street and somebody says, tell me something about permaculture and you've got five minutes. Another thing that you mentioned there was also coming to an understanding of our personal learning styles as well as our personal teaching styles and kind of our area of expertise. And for me, that was a very valuable moment because I always thought that I was, I was a good listener when it came to sitting in a class and listening to a lecture and taking notes and that that was the way that I learned. But I quickly came to understand that, no, I'm a, I'm a hands-on or what was the technical term for that? A kinesthetic learner? That's right, yes. And through that dynamic of being in that classroom with other students who ranged from people such as myself who were just interested in teaching to people who were, you know, university professors. I think there were three terminal degrees among two individuals in that class. <laughs> and from that, coming to understand my role and niche as an educator, that there is a particular place where I have expertise. That's the place that I should focus on. And that's really helped to develop my personal approach to permaculture and understanding that I'm not a great gardener. But if we want to sit down and talk process or the philosophical underpinnings of permaculture, that's a great place that I like to plug into. And that's a sense of knowing because most people who come to the course have not touched into that part of their personality yet. And it can be very overwhelming. It's like, oh, I'm going to go and I'm going to have to learn all these aspects. And really what, we're, what our goal is is to, is to really focus on what works best for that person. That's in. And that's why I keep the courses to generally around 15 people because it is a very individually focused, advanced course. You know? And my goal is to create a sense of empowerment that yields confidence. And that is one of the things, you know, they don't come with confidence. They're very shy or they don't feel... Um, maybe even entitled to, to share information, and that by practicing multiple presentations, the difference between that first off-the-cuff experience to the final presentations is always extraordinary and very exciting. And the course is really outlined, sort of very action-oriented, and it unfolds as a design methodology where each topic builds on the previous one, and we are always moving back to revisit what was said or demonstrated. And so Again, that's, that's, I'm modeling what I would do in a permaculture design course as well. And really, this teacher training is not just about teaching a PDC because really most people who take this course are not going to do a, a full-on permaculture design course. They might be teaching adults in um, a university setting or they might be teaching um, youth at, at a youth farm. They might have a demonstration site that they're working on and they want to teach people, they might teach in prisons, they might teach corporations. I mean, there's a wide variety of venues for people to teach what permaculture is. And my recommendation is you start small, just like the, one of my favorite permaculture principles. You start small and you teach a one-hour introductory talk at the local library. You know, you go to the Grange or, you know, you start small and then maybe you do a day-long workshop and then maybe a two-day workshop, and then you bring in other people, and then all of a sudden you're building your chops to actually, if you're so inclined, to start becoming involved in full-on courses. You know, your audience is, influences who you're teaching, you know, um, what part of the world you're working in, is it urban, suburban, rural, what cultural environment that you're teaching in, and all of those aspects will play a huge part in how you share the information. It's like with permaculture design, there's the strategies, so there's the big pictures, and then there's those techniques that you utilize in order to design a system. In this course, we're offering a lot of strategies, big picture thinking of how to accomplish the goal of sharing specific information. And then the recipes come in showing examples of like how to do mapping, you know, like mapping the territory. We'll do an interactive exercise outside where you utilize whatever is around, whatever kind of materials are around, and you create a border of the place where you are teaching, and then you put in, so, okay, so where's the pond, where are the buildings? And so all of a sudden you're taking what you have learned about a place and putting it on the ground as a sample mapping mop exercise. 
I'll be referencing my own experiences in the teacher training repeatedly. <laughs> I love that. That's great. It's such a joy to be able to talk with you in this environment and that you know what I'm talking about, even though it has changed quite a bit since you took the course. It's, it's exciting to have this conversation. And feel free at any point to add on to how things have changed, because it has been, well, it'll be four years this August since I took the course. And that idea of confidence, I know coming into it, I felt like I had the least permaculture experience of anyone in the room. But through the experience that I still, there was a lot of valid information and ideas that I could share because of my experiences. And it it reaffirmed the role that my technical background, having a degree in computer science, could have within the realm of permaculture. And some of the evening opportunities that we had to sit and discuss different things and give more off-the-cuff presentations. And from that, I remember one of the points that was raised is that confidence is built by a series of small successes. And that really made a big difference for me in getting out there and taking one step after another. And the hands-on experience in the classroom, which really felt like a safe environment, to be able to do that and to receive a critique that was useful on building the information that I was learning in the class, as well as my personal presentation style. And that's a, a hugely important part of this course is we're constantly evaluating daily how we're doing, you know, what's working, what isn't working. And uh, we do an interview when people come into the course. And so I, it's an entrance interview, one would say. And I ask a series of questions. And one of those questions is, how are you most comfortable receiving feedback? And, you know, I, I'm always prefacing it that we're doing it in a respectful manner and that you do this positive sandwich where you give a positive thought about how somebody is doing and then you offer up an example of how they might improve something and then you end it with a positive. And so that we're constantly learning by offering suggestions of how, one, how things can be different. And, and to me that evaluation process is huge. So we're doing individual evaluations for each one, each person, and offering it. It's very peer-based and it's peer, you know, so we're speaking as a community basically. We build community in this course. And then there's also the mid-course evaluation where we've, we are assessing how things are going with the venue, what we're liking, how things and, and things that could use improvement. And then also within the curriculum and the facilitation so that if things are not working mid-course, we can see how can we change it so it will be improved throughout the rest of the course. That is via small groups and then coming together as a large group and everybody reporting their thoughts on how things are going. And so that we see this as a group mind because everybody's not going to be satisfied with everything and every, you know, we all have different opinions. And so as a group talking about it, it brings more clarity to the evaluation process. And then the final evaluation is written by the group and then it is personally written so that that's given to us as the co-instructors so that we can review it and see, okay, what can we change for next time? That feedback was really useful for me. I remember we were asked to present information in one of the morning sessions and I tried something different by integrating storytelling into the process. And the feedback that I received really helped me to better understand the cultural context of trying that type of information transmission because there were certain people who couldn't connect to the story because of their own life experiences. Because I referred continually to like the home that someone grew up in and then was reminded that, you know, there are people who often move and don't have a connection with a particular building in that way, but they might have a particular park or a city that they think of as their space or the place that they would think of as home, that it's not necessarily embodied in a building like it was for me. And so there's people who are really comfortable with that kind of situation, that storytelling environment, and then there's people who are very challenged with it. And it's not only the storytelling aspect of it, but what is the story that you're sharing? And so that just harkens back again is who is the audience? And how can you work with most of the people within that audience? A couple things that I've changed, having learned through experiences, one, one of those things is the learning style segment or module. I call them modules, so the, the, the particular topic. So there's multiple modules within this teacher training. As an example, I used to start out with just talking about learning styles, you know, ways people learn. And I realized, you know, 
I don't really want to be standing up here lecturing for an hour talking about learning styles. So, so, so what we developed, or I developed, was a poster gallery, and that is about uh, 15 posters, large, like easel-sized poster pieces of paper, that actually describe different ways that we learn. And, and so the group moves from poster to poster and writes down, and what I ask them is get a sense of the poster, of what it's saying, and then what is it that resonates most with you as far as your learning style? And, you know, of course, if I start talking learning styles, that would be a whole nother couple hours of conversation. But, so, you know, whether you're a kinesthetic, auditory, or um, visual learner, are you an intrapersonal or interpersonal? I mean, all these different ways. And so write that down and then meet in a small group. So they, uh, people, um, after they've looked through all the posters, then they have an opportunity to meet within small groups and discuss their personal learning styles. And then we, I do a 15-minute slideshow that repeats some of, what, of the information that was in the poster gallery and then goes deeper into describing learning styles. And then the participants each partner up with someone else and they take that off-the-cuff presentation that they did the first day of class and they demonstrate an example of teaching a learning style that their partner most resonates with. So in the beginning, you might have, as an example, you might have given an off-the-cuff presentation. What was, do you remember what your off-the-cuff presentation was on? I remember it was one of the principles of permaculture from Holmgren, but I don't remember which one at the moment. So let's just take one as an example. It could be um, obtaining a yield. And so you could just be talking about how in the garden you can obtain a yield and go through five minutes of describing that. Or you could go out into the garden and actually do a quick little planting of some seeds. Now, you'd have to have a setup for that. You know, you'd have time to prepare for that. But it's an example of how can we actually address the learning style of someone that you're working with. And then after people have paired up and done this off-the-cuff experience, in teaching, and then we actually go outside and we do another experiential learning. So all of a sudden we've got, in three hours, we have about four to five ways that we're talking about learning styles in different ways. So if somebody doesn't get it through the postering, then they might get it through the PowerPoint or they might get it through actually offering up an example of learning styles. So the goal, of course, is to bring as many ways to address teaching a specific topic so that everybody in the room gets it one way or another. And I tell you, that is the art of teaching. One of my current instructors, a piece of his feedback for us as he's teaching us to teach the material we're learning from him is that if one or two people in the room don't get it, then that's something that an instructor can go back and address with them in order to improve their experience, but if no one in the room gets it, then it's an issue with the instructor and they have to go back and change their overall style for that material in order to make it work. And it sounds like for you, the art of teaching is in that first piece of reaching as many people as possible through your teaching style. That's correct, yes. Another aspect of the art of teaching is creating a safe environment where people can feel comfortable so they can actually receive information, where it's a non-threatening environment, where they're comfortable, to, you know, it's like set and setting. You know, where, where are you teaching? What's the venue? How do you create an environment where people are ready to be there? And, and I, you know, that's setting the tone, you know, building a safe place where group dynamics and interchange are cultivated. I set that tone straight away. That's like one of the first things that we talk about is setting the tone. And setting the tone is done, to me, the same way no matter where you are. You know, creating a sense of respect and that openness and that all questions are honored. And you go through this process where people can go, oh, I can relax here. This is a comfortable place and I'm going to be taken care of. In a residential situation, that goes right into the food that's prepared. It's like part of that is set and setting. It's like, in the questionnaire, I always ask, have a questionnaire that people fill out before they arrive so I have a sense of their needs and you know, what their expectations are for the course, et cetera. 
And one of the questions is, is what is your daily diet like? And what is your comfort level around that? And that we address those dietary needs with the cooks that are part of the venue. And that can't always take place, but you know, where, when I teach here at Wilson Creek Gardens, we have people, we hire people who can focus on a wide, you know, a wide variety of diets that are very important for people to have to maintain their happiness because if they're happy in their tummies, they're going to be happy in the classroom and they're going to be receptive participants. I remember all the food when I was with you in Oregon was wonderful and that was not long after my celiac disease diagnosis and I never had a problem with any of the food the entire week there. I was able to eat freely and break bread with everyone and walk away full and... Not only you know, did I have my own issues, but we had vegans and other vegetarians there. And I can say everyone was taken care of in that environment. And the importance of that communal experience, as some of us were cooking breakfast certain days and making sure everyone was fed, that we got to really embody those ethics of permaculture, of taking care of ourselves, but also the other people who were there with us. Yes, thank you for pointing that out, because self-care is also something that's addressed early on in the course. And if we're not taking care of ourselves, then we are not going to be much good to anyone. And really, the way these courses are run, every moment is pretty much full, and as it being an advanced course, and that we want to keep people healthy and happy so that they can be as receptive as possible. And it's going to be very interesting because the teacher training that um, we are offering in New York, which is happening in the end of June, is going to be the first non-residential teacher training that I have taught. And that will be a whole other cultural experience as well, being in the big city rather than out in a, a rural environment and you know, having to think about timing and, you know, are people going to miss their train or, you know, all these other variables that will impact the course, let alone the culture of being in a very urban environment. So I'm looking forward to that experience and saying, okay, the topics will be the same, but am I going to be shifting the presentation styles to most fit this cultural experience? With that residential experience, you have some more flexibility because you can run things a little later or start a little later if you run late the night before and things like that. But because of this non-residential experience and the location, you'll need to be adapting what you're doing to kind of stay within the outline of the course a little more focused. Yes, because in a residential setting, you know, if somebody's oversleeping or something, you can grab them and go to the tent and say, hey, you know, where are you? What's going on? Though in a a non-residential course, you know, if they're not there, we don't exactly know what's happened to them, but, you know, we can call them on the phone to check in. You know, there's those unknowns that happen. You've got a family emergency. You you can't make it to class quite on time. So there'll be that kind of maybe, maybe not, you know, but for me, future tripping and thinking about, okay, what do I need to, how can I best prepare for this teaching opportunity, you know, what are the things that, you know, that I need to be thinking about? And also, as an example, the outside activities that we do and the hands-on activities at the commons where this course is going to be, be held, there is a rooftop garden that Monica, who is one of the organizers with Beyond Organic Design, she and other folks have established a permaculture garden up on the rooftop of this this building. And so that's where we'll get our outdoor activities and learning from versus going out on the streets and in, uh, in Brooklyn. So, yeah, it'll be fun. It'll be a great opportunity to see how we will co-evolve this learning experience. And truly, that is how I look at all teaching. It's like we are co-evolving. We are working together. I'm learning just as much as everybody else is learning, and we're sharing one of the, the important parts, I think, of these courses and establishing the tone is that we're really learning from each other. I bring lots of resources. Other people bring resources, and we share that, um, whether it's, you know, via on the computer kind of resources or just ex- resources from life, and that everyone there is creating this group experience. Could you provide us a rundown of what, topics you'll be covering in your upcoming course and kind of serve as an outline for where the teacher training that you developed is now? Well, one of the things that's different from when you took the course, I do believe, is that now each participant is co-facilitating for a day of the course. 
and they have instructions on how to do that, and that is something that we've co-developed as we've done this between the participants and uh, myself is that they are co-facilitating, you know, like the morning check-in announcements, you know, that half hour in the morning where we're just kind of landing in place, basically, and then they will make sure that I stay on time or any of the other instructors stay on time. They are building posters, again, for our group memory, because one of the things that posters do, which means these are um, writing on the easel and putting these big pieces of paper around the room so that if somebody comes in, they can really see what we've been talking about, or it also kind of jogs the memory about certain topics we've spoken about. So in essence, they are running the course. The students, the participants are running the course, and each day getting practice and confidence because there, there's this thing about, you know, you, you teach the information and you are also a facilitator. You have to facilitate, and we have quite a long, lengthy session on facilitation. You know, how do you work with keeping everything basically together besides the general information that we are offering as the, you know, the download, let's say, of the course content. So you asked about the curriculum. You know, like I said, we start with setting the tone. We have a general course introduction and presentations are throughout. We talk about philosophy and ethics of being an educator, which is distinctly different but can be wrapped around in the same. If you think about our core ethics in permaculture, you know, caring for the earth. So how can, as, a, as an educator, how can you care for the earth? And so examples could be, you know, what kind of teaching supplies are you bringing? You know, what kind of paper are you using? What water, you know, how much water is being used? I mean, just all the aspects when you think about caring for the earth, how can you create that and wrap that into your teaching ethics and demonstrating that caring for the people, being respectful of everyone who's attending, you know, being a guide, you know, maybe keeping your ego more in your pocket and kind of having a more um, egalitarian way of presenting information, thinking about gender balance. Again, you know, caring for people that, you know, are we comfortable? Is it a comfortable setting? Is it too warm? Is it too cold? You know, how's the lighting? What are the seats like? And then, you know, for me, sharing the surplus, how can we share our information wherever we are? So that would be, you know, the, those ethics of being an educator. And then, the art of, and science of teaching, the pedagogy of teaching, you know, models of learning. There's this, you know, the new paradigm of education. Jesse Wolf Harden wrote a, an article for the activists and probably 12 years ago where he just talks about, you know, how can we change the sense of education? And for me, you know, wonder and awe, creating a sense of wonder and awe and exciting the mind for for learning new things. And then we'll have, you know, integrating different methodologies of permaculture principles within each teaching module. Uh, we talk about the global permaculture scene, you know, what is happening in permaculture throughout the world and where can you continue your education. Uh, we talk about, of course, whole systems design relative to learning styles and assessments cultural diversity, building facilitation skills, and the tricks of working with guests and co-instructors. I always ask if I have somebody coming in as a guest, I ask for an outline of what they're going to be talking about, making sure that, that we're all on the same page about how much time there is, what topic we are looking for them to cover. Um, I talked about asset mapping. Doing, we do a demonstration of outdoor hands-on activities. I, hands-on modules, I think, are one of the toughest modules to do. And so I've kind of learned over time by making mistakes of how to create a very effective hands-on outdoor module. Of course, we spend lots of time on curriculum planning and building. And we follow, I'm um, a big proponent of um, Mollison's 72-hour permaculture course curriculum and the topics that are included in that. Though, of course, with any course that you're teaching, one would bring in local aspects of information as well. We do lesson planning. And then with each one of these, there are interactive activities that really get the mind wrapped around how to actually do this kind of thing, like building a curriculum. Like in a half an hour, people who are more drawn to doing a one-hour talk on permaculture, they work together and they build, okay, what are we going to talk about within each minute of that hour that will yield a specific outcome? Or maybe some people want to do a weekend workshop 
and what would be the curriculum? What would you talk about? How would you, not only the curriculum, but how would you demonstrate that curriculum? So again, that's more interactive activities as an example. And we talk about decision making. And then throughout the course, people are doing presentations. So there are blocks of time set for individual presentations. We do course planning, you know, like figuring out venues, dates, budgets, timeline, marketing, and then implementation of all that course planning. Um, we talk about presenting styles and methods. You know, how do you actually present information and what is your particular style? I mean, all of us know what our favorite teacher's style is. They're stick, you know, they're a comic, they're a storyteller, you know, they just download tons of information. What is it that you are most drawn to and most comfortable, your style of presenting information? Mm -hmm. We talk about field trips and how to, you know, um, orchestrate field trips. And then we also talk about um, ma uh, mentors and apprentices and work, you know, sharing information with others. And then assessments, you know, evaluating how do you evaluate a course, writing evaluations. And then throughout, you know, I'm offering stories from my experience, you know, how people can learn from my mistakes, I, um, teacher's kit, what I bring to a course with me. And then if anything else that people want to talk about, we address one way or another. And this is six and a half days, and so it's really a packed experience. And then the last day, we do presentations and we open that up to the public. And so the participants are offering up in an afternoon five-minute presentations on the aspect of permaculture that they wish to share with our audience. And it is considered an introduction to permaculture. That's kind of a, the basics of it. And then the evenings, uh, sometimes there's guests and they are always optional. And we also have time where participants can share their particular resources or their personal projects and get feedback on them. Sometimes we'll do design charrettes. So there's definitely some flexibility in the schedule for interactive participants' activities. It's a pretty comprehensive curriculum that the feedback is, is that it offers people the opportunity to move forward. And I am very proud of, of many people who have taken this course and that they're actually doing the work out there that so desperately needs to be done in all kinds of situations. I and mean, we have people who are teaching, you know, in the high school situation or elementary school that have brought these concepts of permaculture into the science classes. From my experience in the course with you over those six and a half days, it was an intense time. And I know that it was very challenging, and there were some times that were trying to take everything in and be able to evaluate ourselves and figure out where we are and what we want to do. Some of the challenging questions that we had to ask ourselves and the conversations some of the various students had during breaks and things. It's just a very intensive time with all the information that's provided. And I know that I came home with, I think it was like 100 pages of my own handwritten notes, not including all the things that you shared with us digitally and that the fellow students shared with one another that we had created during the time and being able to step away from it. But I think one of the biggest pieces for me with having the appropriate set and setting was the candor that came up during not only the entrance interview for me with you and Andrew, but also among all of the students and our experiences and also what you shared with us when we discussed some of the deeper details about things like renting a venue or if someone invites you in to be a guest instructor and you've reached a point where you're no longer volunteering your time if you've moved on to being a professional. You know, what should you ask for or expect? when you go to a course like that as a guest. And the other piece was, that came from that that made the actual practical side of teaching make more sense was how much time we actively need to be prepared to put into developing our modules. We can't just off the cuff it all the time. And if I remember the number right, it was anywhere for every hour that we present, we should expect to spend one to 20 hours preparing for it outside of that experience. Exactly. On average, it's around 20 hours. And, and part of that is, at least for me, when I'm preparing for a specific module, I have the nuggets that I want to share. And then there's the rabbit hole where you go down. It's like, and actually, I've, I've, I've changed the rabbit hole concept to actually the galaxy concept. Because really, for me, it's like, 
I want to start learning about learning styles as an example. And then you just go onto the Internet or you start looking at books. There's this galaxy of information. There is so much information out there that I'm just pulling from. And then all of a sudden, I've got to chisel all that amazing information down to, again, back into the nuggets that will be a 20-minute module or a half-hour module or a 45-minute module. And, you know, for my you know, learning styles, I probably have – over a hundred just files like computer, and then I've got probably a half a ream of paper that I've gathered. So it's like, okay. And and I show that to participants, you know, I mean I explain that to participants here. I have all this information that I've gathered to share with you on this particular topic and I can only share with you the smallest amount. And then that's where the resources come in. And and it's important to share that you're not going to get every bit of information. You're going to get an overview. You're going to understand the strategies. And then you're going to have the tools of how to find out more information and then and, and guide that you know, process. And that toolkit's really important because, as you were saying, you know, we all have different learning styles. And with that, as educators, our presenting style may not be the same as our learning style. That's been a really valuable piece for me in that I really enjoy a dialogue or a conversation and being able to do small group dynamics and one-on-one mentoring and to sit and talk and then discuss as opposed to using lots of slides. Like regarding the permaculture material as a whole, I'm very process-oriented, work on those technical sides of things, and then knowing where my weaknesses are and being able to ask others to join me as guests to build on that material and provide the resources that aren't my bag of cats. And that understanding that comes from the teacher training as you talk about that galaxy of information, knowing my styles, knowing a lot about myself in going through that teacher training process, I'm able to more quickly discard certain pieces that I know that I'm not going to use, but still document them to provide as resources for others later. Exactly. Well said. And it was that teacher training experience that got me to further my education and go on from where I was, you know, at that time in 2011, thinking that I was just going to go off and start integrating more into the permaculture community and teaching permaculture directly, but finding more and more that I wanted to study more formally informal education and that experiential learning experience. And I just, overall, I was very, I'm still very thankful for the teacher training experience and what it taught me about myself and my role as an educator and how that provides me with a a niche to fill. And that's something that I know that we talked about in some of the after the evening sessions and things is, you know, where do you fit into your community? Where do you fit into the world as a teacher? And what's your best role to have? And that's something that, you know, later David Holmgren shared with me was that idea that, you know, as permaculturists, we should seek to be generalists as much as we can, but to have two or three niches that we fill where we are specialists and really diversify the place that we come from. That's a long-winded way of me saying thank you, Jude, for all the work that you've put into the teacher training material and the experience for the students because it's a really valuable course for people to take if they have just the slightest interest in teaching this material or if they're doing it already and want to become better at it. And for me, it's such an honor to be able to share my experiences and and what I've learned to see how we can really be changing the world. And that's what permaculture has been doing from when I started in, you know, 1985 with this whole concept to this explosion that is now reality-based, not just some fringe subject, and that you know, we've got enough um, examples of working demonstration sites and people who are teaching this information all over the world that it's just, to me, actually mind-boggling when I see you know, the transition over time. And it can be very subtle just in conversations to, you know, going into the university setting where we're, we're shifting people's whole minds. It's like I taught at the University of Oregon several permaculture courses, and that environment is so distinctly different from a residential permaculture course and how people come in and they're, they're expecting to sit again in rows and they're expecting me to just show PowerPoint after PowerPoint. 
and you know the first thing that we do is we put the chairs in a circle and we start having a conversation and all of a sudden critical thinking questions come into play and we get people's minds active in a way that is life-changing and that's really what you're saying too is that you've seen how this can happen really in all kinds of environments though i'd like to sit and talk about this experience both from my own time in the course and what you developed so far as we come to the end of our time today do you have any final thoughts for the listeners regarding the teacher training course or any other projects that you're working on teaching is an exhilarating experience and the essence of this course is to encourage and inspire those who are attending to really enhance their unique strengths and talents. And that's done by, of course, this demonstrating of diverse teaching techniques and that the idea of being grounded in place and being open to the knowledge that can help really transform an individual to being able to be comfortable and empowered to share the information from within themselves with other people is, to me, the greatest, one of the great thrills in life is really like hearing about your story and what, how you're evolving and, and you know, getting your master's and it's very exciting and, and other people who are um, t- taking this information and hitting the road with it. So I'm grateful that you um, took the course and that you have invited me to be part of your incredible podcast. And um, I look forward to seeing you in New York because you're going to be a guest instructor. I don't want to interview you, but do you want to talk about your session? I'm still coming up with titles, but I want to focus on... I'll just say that the yours was account. one of the longest titles that I had. I was trying to fit it in. It was pretty fun. <laughs> well, it's, I, the presentation style that I've come up with over the years is kind of a shock and awe introduction followed by a discussion. So I'm looking at using the time that I have to do two short sessions, one of which will be on establishing a sense of place. And that comes from some of the environmental education reformers, David Orr and David Sobel. And then the other is looking to encompass many of the things that you've discussed during our conversation today and also that many of the students will be learning about ahead of time when it comes to learning styles and presentation styles. And that's on the importance of dialogue or the role of dialogue in creating an open, informal education experience. And the dialogue is something... That doesn't happen. You know, the Socratic method of teaching and learning, you know, that asking those critical thinking questions. If we can teach our children at an early age to ask questions and then have them honored and answered, think about how learning would be so much different and the education system would be so much different. And it really sounds like what you have your master's in is moving very significantly in in that direction. And it's a direction that I'm planning to continue in because of, as a conversation that I had with someone recently, he was saying, you know, we, especially as Americans, are taught very often, well, how do I fix something? Kind of like an engineer's mindset, as opposed to what is the problem and why am I looking for a solution to it? And I find that, you know, the Socratic method and asking critical thinking questions are the pieces that step us back to those root questions that can provide a more beautiful and elegant solution, whether that's in the landscape or with people. There was one other thing that you had mentioned to me in setting up this interview was about your work with developing PINA. And I was hoping you could share that with us before we draw this interview to a close. Yes, I've been working on PINA, which is Permaculture Institute of North America, with about seven other longtime practicing permaculturalists for about five years. And PINA is a professional organization designed to support students and experienced practitioners of permaculture in North America. And it's a peer-driven permaculture organization that is based on being support and offering continuing education for those of us in the permaculture field. And if your listeners 
have an opportunity to purchase or actually subscribe to the Permaculture Activist, which is now called Permaculture Design, the summer 2015 issue. Penny Livingston and Peter Bain co-wrote an article called Revival of a Peer-Driven Permaculture Organization, and it describes our goals, which is to raise and maintain the professional standards in permaculture design teaching and other disciplines to support permaculture education through a certifying process that recognizes achievement and excellence. So we are in the process of issuing diplomas for for those who have been in the field for a long period of time and and then to provide a structure for communication among permaculture design course graduates. So it's really an organization that we have developed that our goal is to have regional hubs throughout North America, Canada, Mexico, all of the U.S. that will provide a connection, a web of individuals who have or have been in the um, permaculture experience, whether new or have been in, involved in, in permaculture for many years, so that a conversation is building. There's networking that, we, that the, the design of the website will have um, lists of you know, calendars of, of permaculture courses that are kind of approved, which means that those courses follow the Malsonian curriculum, and that the hubs, the regional hubs, act as um, organizations where board members will be elected from and that they will be the opportunity for mentoring to happen. The idea for the regional hubs is to have the hubs be self-forming and for there to be a group of individuals that work together that support the permaculture community in their area. And right now we're defining those areas, whether it's state by state or whether it's the Midwest. Here in the Northwest, it's apt to be Oregon, Washington, maybe Idaho. California is apt to have two hubs. And that we are working together to support each other to further our permaculture education. It's really one of the main goals. And if people would like to find more information about this, do you have a website for Pina? PermacultureNorthAmerica.org. I think that's pretty much it. You know, just be thinking of, of a professional association of regional hubs working across North America to grant diplomas, preserve the integrity and quality of the permaculture design course, and facilitate networking among permaculturalists. That is what Pina is. And truthfully, this came to be because um, many of my students were saying, okay, what's next? What do I do next? And there are definitely other um, diploma granting organizations out there. We found that what I heard a lot was, we want this to be grassroots. We don't want this to come from top down. We want to have it so that we are all working together and it's peer driven. And so what we're finding is that at this point it's a bit top down because we're getting all the protocols in order. And so the next layer is, okay, now we have to get regional hubs engaged so that it truly will be a grassroots organization and that we won't be those of us. I, I'm very much looking forward to stepping down from the board and getting back to my regional organization. And so, you know, how can we create this web of different regional groups to actually fulfill the mission of Pina. So even though it's a top-down approach at the moment, that's a very normal kind of place for many organizations to start. But as you grow to pass that, for lack of a better word in the moment, authority down to the various regional peer-to-peer -peer groups while still being overseen by an international organization. North American. The international is more PRI. They're more than international. We've just decided to focus on North America, which is plenty big. That will provide then the professional network, and then the regional hubs can be overseen by the larger organization, and that larger organization can kind of serve to accreditate those regional hubs and to ensure that the overall mission and core requirements are being met. Yes. Part of the call to me was, how do we maintain the integrity of permaculture? You know, not everyone is, is teaching a permaculture course taking into consideration the standard curriculum. And really, I kind of come from this in, in multiple ways. It's like we are in such a 
dire state of being on the planet. And do we really need another organization to tell us what to do and how to practice permaculture? Yes and no. Let's just go out and do it, hit the streets and get the work done. And then there's also that place of, okay, we're holding the ethics of permaculture and the integrity of permaculture. How do we go about doing that? So there's different ways to look at it. This is another option for people who are interested, especially those who are going to be utilizing permaculture in their professional livelihoods. Jude, it's been a long time since we've been in touch, and I'm glad that we were able to sit down and have this conversation. So thank you for joining me today to discuss everything that we have about the permaculture teacher training experience, what people can expect, and for sharing your personal experiences with us throughout and for letting everyone know what Pina is and what it's about so that people can go find out more information and get involved. It's always been a wonderful time every time I've gotten to speak with you, and I'm glad we'll be able to share this conversation with the world. Thank you so much, Scott. It's been a pleasure, and thank you for all the work that you're doing. We really appreciate being able to turn on the podcast and and find out what's going on all over the world relative to permaculture. And that was Jude Hobbs. You can find more about her work at CascadiaPermaculture.com. At BeyondOrganicDesign.org are further details about the upcoming teacher training at the Commons in Brooklyn, New York, which runs from June 24th to June 30th, 2015. The course is being offered on a sliding scale and is limited to 15 participants. My understanding is that they are reaching capacity quickly, so sign up now via the link in the show notes. That link will take you directly to the course page, where you can find out more information. Though many years have passed since I took my teacher training course with Jude, Andrew, and Rico, the impact of my time spent with them at Jude's home in 2011 still sits with me. This class led me to the path I am on now with the plan and seeking to formally study and understand the ways in which people learn so that we can better teach through informal and experiential learning. The course also helped me understand that though I am a kinesthetic learner, I prefer to present through conversation with only the necessary images or graphics, and generally I abhor PowerPoint unless it is absolutely required. And that in turn changes the way I teach. Rather than mimicking the styles of others, I found a way that I am comfortable with, balanced by knowing and understanding that it is not an approach that reaches everyone and requires that I adjust my programs as needed to the audience. This course also gave me enough successes to build the confidence necessary to continue to put myself out into the world and start with those presentations at places like the local library and see them expand to discussions at the monthly meeting of the County Master Gardeners Group and to set up an informational table on rain barrels and vermicomposting at a local nature center and later return there to give an afternoon demonstration on how worms can eat our garbage. This last one really drew in the children and made their parents a bit squeamish, but was still a really fun time for me as I watched the children get engaged and how I could use that to get their parents interested, to show parents how they could use something like this as an educational tool, or how it could replace their compost bin in their kitchen, or become a small business raising worms, or creating compost tea or even just for some of the families that like to fish together, growing and harvesting red wigglers for that recreational activity. Experiences like that allow the opportunities that are available to continue to grow, and I count my teacher training as one of the transition points where I really began to push my personal boundaries. I left the course feeling confident and being able to put myself out there to be a resource to anyone who wanted to reach out to me. If you're in any way considering teaching permaculture, I highly recommend Jude's teacher training. It's a very intense information dump, but it's a great experience. And you can learn so much through that process, whether you want to teach formally or informally, whether you run a farm and you want to do one farm education, whether you're someone who wants to teach at a nature center, or if you're a listener to Permi Kids and you'd like to do more teaching permaculture to children and doing that kind of work in parallel with what Jen Mendez is sharing, I don't think you can go wrong doing this. If you have any inclination to teach, take the teacher training and find out whether or not that's the place you want to be. 
whether or not you do decide to teach, you walk away with a better understanding of yourself and in turn how to best apply what it is you know. If you're not in a place, looking at Jude's schedule or like with a class upcoming in Brooklyn, you can't make something like that, reach out to her through Cascadia Permaculture and ask who else she would recommend that you take a teacher training with. We're here as a community of permaculture practitioners with a large number of resources so that each of us can succeed in whatever road we're walking down. And though it's quite a bit dated at this point, I've included a link to my original review of the teacher training in the show notes so you can listen to my first impressions shortly after completing the class when I was still very much a novice in the world of permaculture. With that, if there's any way that I can help you with your permaculture education or the path that you're on, your professional development, please let me know how I can be of service. Email show at the permaculturepodcast.com, call 717-827-6266, write the Permaculture Podcast, P.O. Box 16, Dauphin, Pennsylvania, 17018. You can also follow the show on Twitter at permaculturecst and join in the discussions at facebook.com slash the permaculture podcast. Finally, I want to get information about permaculture to as many people as possible and need your help to do it. Help me grow the show by taking a few minutes of your time and doing a few things for me. Review the show on iTunes or your preferred podcast site. Listen to the show with friends or family members. Post a link to your favorite episode on your blog, Facebook, Reddit, Twitter, or wherever else you get social with media. Make a one-time donation by mail or via the PayPal link at thepermaculturepodcast.com. Become a member at patreon.com slash permaculturepodcast. If you're a teacher and want to include what you've heard in an episode, in your course material, please do. I just ask that you let people know where the podcast came from so your students can connect with me and the show. If you run a permaculture study group, listen to an episode together, discuss it, and let me know how it went. If you'd like me to come speak with your group or Skype in for a discussion, those are options too. And you can contact me for more details using that phone number, 717-827-6266, or an email, show at the permaculturepodcast.com. Until the next time, take care of Earth, yourself, and each other.